So last week in Sheffield, they unveiled uh, a monument to the so-called Women of Steel, um, women who had worked in the factories uh, in Sheffield. Sheffield is famous for its steel industry, of course, um, during the Second World War, actually the First World War as well, while uh, you know all the men were away at uh, fighting the war. Um, women were sucked into those industries and, you know, in quite a contradictory way, had quite a liberating experience, you know, found, found themselves working in these, you know, very strenuous manual labour jobs, which are mostly associated with all kinds of things that our society associates with masculinity um, and all of that being having to be strong, having to work extremely long hours, having to, you know, do, do the kinds of jobs that, that they hadn't done before. Also, of course, having to look after their uh, children, but actually there being some social provision for that being provided by the state during the course of the war in order to enable women to go to work and continue the industries that the war effort needed. I think that that period um, is quite instructive as a glimpse of the reality of the role that the family plays and women's role inside of that and the way that it shapes um, women's expectations of themselves, how they uh, believe they're meant to act and, uh, and what they're capable of and so on. Because when they were unveiling the, the monument in Sheffield, which by the way was paid for by public, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean individual donations from, from the public, 160 grand uh, to pay for it, they interviewed some of the, the women who'd been um, workers in the Second World War, who are all in their 90s now, and they talked, they're still really angry. They were fuming about being kicked out of the factories at the end of the war because, of course, that's what happened as soon as the, the war was over and men came back, uh, they got their jobs back in the factories and women were just kicked out and back into the home for a lot of people. Now, of course, a lot of women uh, still would have worked in, in one capacity or another, but, but shoved back really into the primary role being the one of the housewife, the one who does the, the housework, raises the children, has all the caring responsibilities and stuff. And these women were absolutely fuming because what they had had as workers in, that, in those factories was a sense of um, independence, economic independence, which is fantastically important. They had a sense of uh, making a major contribution to the public world and not simply being seen as, as you know, carers for, for children and, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. And they had a level of liberation in terms of their relationships around them. Uh, you know, and I think this was a generalised thing during the war where families were forcefully broken up by the fact that, that, that men were sent away um, to war and actually people who were left behind had all kinds of different relationships. You know, you can read stuff about um, homosexual relationships that took place during the war, you know, and all the kind of, a lot of the kind of moral um, attacks on people for having different kinds of relationships receded, you know. Uh, society turned a blind eye to, to a lot of the prejudices that, that would have existed normally, you know, in normal circumstances, so-called, um, before and after the war. And of course, all of those things were kind of pushed back with a vengeance um, as soon as the war ended. So I think what the whole experience of, of the Second World War, just that little story that you can hear about now, throws into sharp relief the role of the family under capitalism and how the, the shape of it, you know, how we reproduce what women do uh, and so on, is really driven by the needs of profit and the needs of the system. It, you know, in that case, capitalist imperialism and the needs of, of the war drive and, uh, and industry and so on. But actually the same is, is true in our everyday lives um, today. I think obviously a lot has changed in terms of the family and, and women's roles since, since the 1940s. Um, the vast majority of women do work, um, you know, m many of them full-time, uh, and if you include part-time work as well, then even a majority of, of women with young children go out to work. But this hasn't somehow magically um, got rid of all of those other pressures of child rearing, other caring responsibilities to other members of the family, uh, and so on. Um, and all of those responsibilities still fall primarily um, onto women. Um, there's some figures that are quite astounding, which you can see in, in Judith Orr's book um, on Marxism and Women's Liberation, about uh, an American website called What is a Mom Worth? which is tries to calculate the value of the work that women do for free in the home. 
uh, if it was paid for at, at market rates. Uh, a full-time mother in the US is estimated to be worth $118,905 per year. Um, and even a working mum who uh, you know, would therefore necessarily have to do less in the home is still worth about $70,000. I guess that's about 40,000 quid. Um, the, um, uh, another survey in um, 2013 estimated that worldwide, uh, that, sorry, that unpaid childcare is worth something like 343 billion pounds per year. Um, the equivalent of 23%, sorry, that's not worldwide, that's in, in Britain, 23% of, of GDP. And when you think about those kinds of figures, it, it's a huge amount of work that is done by women and, you know, and others. It's not always women, of course, who take those responsibilities um, in the home, uh, which is absolutely essential to the system functioning every day because workers can't be exploited if they haven't had a bed to sleep in, if they hadn't had their dinner or their breakfast or, you know, the more vague kind of human needs that we have in terms of emotional support and, and all the other things that, that you um, get at home if, if you're lucky. Um, and of course at the moment the cuts, austerity, all of these things put more and more pressure onto individuals inside the home to provide those things because the, the welfare state is cut away at, you know, and the welfare state of course in somewhere like Britain takes on some of those um, responsibilities um, that otherwise fall to individuals in the family. Um, in the modern family, the family today, a lot of the, you know, the ability of women to uh, go out to work and also to still have to do all the things in the home is enabled by all kinds of gadgets and changes in the way that things are done. So, you know, as compared to women in the Second World War uh, time, you know, we now have all those kinds of things like washing machines, dishwashers, microwaves, processed foods, which are a lot faster to cook. And, you know, all kinds of things take, uh, have uh, been developed in order to allow women to still keep all those responsibilities, not pass them back to capitalism to, to have to pay for, um, but to be able to go out to work as well and be exploited um, in, you know, in a workplace um, as well as, as part of the workforce. And when you think about um, the family and the way we, we think about it today, um, and the way that advertising is so directed towards an idea of what your home should be like, of the ideal family life, everything is about family life, you know, the amount of adverts that are, I think, you know, for a while, what, a decade or two ago, there was a vague attempt to have adverts for cleaning products which involved men. Often these were taking the mick actually out, out of men. Uh, for being weedy, for being the one who's doing the housework, but at least there were men involved in housework in this kind of, um, in these imagined homes. I think these days they don't even bother with that at the moment, as far as I can tell. You know, it's, it has reverted to a very kind of uh, traditional idea of the home and who is responsible for it, the cleaning and all the rest of it. You know, the, the home, the private home, the private family inside of modern capitalism in the 21st century is a place where you're meant to consume huge amounts of stuff, whether they're products or processed foods or, you know, uh, all the other kinds of things, the TV programmes, subscription TV channels, all the things that, that we have to pay for to, to create the, the so-called perfect home. Um, so I think that... Like I say, although lots of things have changed over the last um, century, actually the fundamental role that the family plays is still very clear to see. And it's clear to see that it's, uh, there's a, a material kind of basis for the women's op oppression that's rooted inside of it. Because, of course, the alternative idea is that women's oppression is rooted in some kind of inherent <coughs> desire by men to dominate women, or that it's you know rooted in just some kind of uh, historical um, just thing that's just always been there, it's just the way it's always been, either it's natural or it's, um, uh, you know, it's become something about the ruling class wants to dominate and so on. I think that, that social reproduction, which I'll come on to explain in a second, is about saying that there is capitalism is a system that is driven by the need to make profits. They make profits by exploiting workers 
uh, with a, a worker boss relationship which is exploitative in the sense that the things that people produce which are sold on on the marketplace and exchanged um, you know the workers that produce those things are not paid the full value of what they're producing the capitalist takes a section of that and, and that's what uh, that's what constitutes um, their profits um, that's what capitalism runs on everything else is about enabling that to take place and so I think for for us as, as Marxists having a materialist understanding of, of the role that the family plays both in you know feeding clothing and housing workers and sending them back to work the next day and raising the next generation of workers in terms of children or caring for the last generation of workers in terms of the care of the elderly or, or the sick um, that this is tied in to the very fundamental um, workings of capitalism and so you can't uh, separate it from that and I think it's important when you look at the family today because, you know, we could say, why is it that the family still seems to exist in such a similar form, despite the fact that, that we've made so much progress, that women go out to work, that men aren't the sole breadwinners in most households and so on. Um, but it tends to be, doesn't it, a, a lot of economic decisions that individuals are kind of pressured into making that, that end up replicating uh, the way, you know, the, the family in the traditional kind of way. Not because necessarily the, the husband or the, the, the male partner is a raging sexist, but because, you know, we have a wage gap. If you have children and one of you needs to give up work to look after the child, at least for the first year or two, um, and as is most likely in this country, the, the male partner earns more than the female partner, then it makes sense for the female partner to, to stop working. You know, there's all kinds of other factors come into it as well, but there's a lot of basic realities about the society that we live in that push people into um, just ending up making the same decisions as everyone else does. And it's quite hard not to make those decisions, really. It's quite hard not to live in the way that is, that is prescribed um, to us. And I think that it's, it's that way around, if you like. It's those pressures that push people into the kind of family situations that, that we see. Um, and the ideas around it then kind of justify those decisions. So um, the kinds of ideas around gender uh, and all the rest of it, you know, if you think about other factors that come into a decision for, say, in a couple that are having a child for the woman to stay at home, firstly, it might be an economic decision because she earns less, but also she's likely to feel, well, I'm going to know what to do with the baby better. Uh, I was raised, you know, because she might not think of this consciously, but she'll have been raised with baby dollies being shoved into her hands, maybe a little pram to push around next to her mum when they went out. You know, all kinds of things feed into our expectations of what we think um, we might be going to do as an adult and what kind of role we should play. Something even as uh, insidious as um, the Disney movies, uh, you know, the little the, the animated ones that, that, that are directed at children. There's a study recently that showed that even though there's more yeah. female lead characters in Disney films, actually they say less than they even did in the 1940s in the time of the Snow White and whatever. Male characters get a lot more speaking time and, and vo vocalising uh, of things than, than the female characters um, in, in those kind of things. You know, there's lots and lots of things that add up to feeling. If you're a woman, then it's your role to look nice, to be caring and to be quiet, frankly. You know, and, and all of these things add up and they, they chip away inside your head. Um, so I think... One, uh, the, I think the reason you know, we've got the, the title in terms of social reproduction in the family is because in recent years there's been a resurgence, you know, an interest in looking back and you know, looking forward in terms of trying to have a materialist understanding of the family, the role that it plays for capitalism. That it can't simply explain women's oppression by you know, ideas in people's heads. We have to try and understand why it persists because of the, the, you know, the important economic role that the family plays you know, and the ideological one that comes alongside that. I think, you know, so social reproduction means all of those things that take place in the household, really, the work that primarily women do to raise and educate and feed and house the next generation of workers and to keep the, the current generation going. Um, the, the idea of social reproduction or discussions around this 
first emerged in the, the early 1970s, around that, that generation of activists coming out of 1968, the women's liberation movement in the US, all of those things. And I think for some feminists at that time, you know, they wanted to have, you, you, there, there was a lot of socialist, Marxist ideas in radical movements in the 68 generation, and people were trying to understand capitalism as a system, how it functions, how we change change the system, you know, you're talking about revolution really, people were discussing these kinds of ideas and I think, uh, you know for the women's movement that rose up uh, some feminists said, right, okay we, we take production seriously we take exploitation in the workplace seriously, but what about women's, you know, role inside of the household, what about all the work that women do for free, and I think there was an argument <coughs> that's wrong in my opinion um, from some feminists saying that um, you know, Marxism can deal with women workers, as in women who are in the workplace being exploited alongside men, but it can't deal with working class women who are in the home, who are, you know, facing the drudgery of childcare and all the rest of it. Um, what about that? Can Marxism explain that? Um, and um, there were attempts in various ways, and there's lots of different writers that, that you could look at, and I won't try and go through many of it, uh, much of it now. But one of the ones that people might have heard of is the idea of wages for housework. So there was a, a section of feminists coming out of the 1970s, people like Selma James um, and Maria Della Costa, who talk about um, women's work in the home being a form of exploitation, and that the work women are doing is also producing value in the capitalist system because after all they are reproducing workers labor power and labor power is a commodity um, in the system and so the work that women are doing is being should be kind of fed in to a marxist analysis of exploitation uh, and value and uh, and all of those things and we should see it in those terms and there was various different approaches um, to this question um, and I think, you know, so some people argued that we should reject the concept of work altogether, that actually the problem was being exploited, because there's a, a long tradition in, in, you know, among Marxists and socialists, and I think a correct one, you know, if you go back to the writings of, of Engels on, in 1844, looking at the condition of women uh, in Manchester and places like that in the Industrial Revolution. If you look at Lenin in the early 20th century, looking at the drudgery and the absolute horrendous kind of um, sexism, ingrained sexism that women faced in Russia, um, they all talked about the need for that kind of drudgery to be socialised, to be taken out of the private home. So housework in the house shouldn't be anyone's job, really. It shouldn't be anyone's fate, certainly. It should be, you know, there should be communal kitchens if people don't want to cook at home or they don't have time. There should be laundry services so people don't have, you know, we don't all live in these little boxes replicating exactly the same uh, kind of processes going on using all the electricity and, and all the rest of it these days with our, with our um, machines. In those days, of course, women having to wash by much lengthier and, and harder processes. Um, you know, Marxists like Alexandra Kollontai, like Kripskaya, in, again in Russia at the time, and Rosa Luxemburg in, in Germany, they all talked about the importance of women going out into the workplace and being part of the working class, you know, in that direct sense of being exploited, that actually this is a liberating thing in one sense because it puts them at the heart of the system and as part of a collective class. Um, and that's why I started really with the question of the Sheffield Steel women because that's exactly what they experienced. They experienced the kind of power of being a powerful part of society um, and a collective uh, in society. You know, one of the problems with trying to deal with the question of how can you organise women who are, you know, doing uh, in their homes, you know, trying to argue against the drudgery that they're facing or whatever, is that they're isolated. They're not a collective you know, and it's very difficult to, um, to organise um, on that basis. Um, but I think that, you know, as these debates moved on, part of what was underlying some of the debate was a divergence between the politics of, you know, working class struggle and socialism and Marxism, which underlo underlied a, a lot of the struggles at the time, 
and uh, some parts of the women's movement who looked more to uh, particular kinds of feminist theories and really felt that Marxism and socialism couldn't explain, couldn't handle and couldn't deal with the question of women's oppression properly. So you needed a separate theory to, at, at the very least, add on to Marxism or possibly just to, to fight two battles that maybe you need a battle against exploitation, you need a battle against oppression over here because there's two different processes going on um, uh, inside of the system and socialists are only dealing with one of them. You know, again, of course, this could be true of, of some socialists existing in, in the movement at the time. Absolutely. You know, there will be, um, uh, you know, there can be always be problems in, in real organisations and, uh, and among activists. But in terms of Marxist theory itself, I think this, this, um, this isn't really true. And I think that what we've seen that's quite positive in the last couple of years is, um, I mean, one of the arguments that, that took this on, that, that tried to uh, reconcile the question of looking at women's role in the home, the role of the family for capitalism, and reconcile that with Marxism, was a book called Marxism and the Oppression of Women Toward a Unitary Theory by Lisa Fogel, which was first published in 1983, and it was just republished a couple of years ago um, by Historical Materialism. Um, and she was an American academic, she was part of that generation, uh, she's still around, by the way, um, and she was seeking to, you know, bring together an understanding and say, look, it's not that there's two separate things going on, that there's reproduction happening over here, and that is somehow to do with the oppression of women, and that's separate from what's going on, um, you know, in the workplace, at the heart of exploitation and so on. She said they're part of the same uh, system, really. Um, that production, the way we produce things as a society, and the way that people are exploited, and the way capitalism functions, it completely shapes and really determines how we live, how we reproduce, how we raise our children, and, and how we live in terms of what kinds of homes we have, and so on. And that is partly because for her, you know, as a as a Marxist, she says that for capitalism, reproduction is all about the reproduction of workers. For them, that's their interest. You know, for the system, the interest in, in reproduction is about how do we get the next generation of workers with the appropriate skills to come into our workplaces and make profits for us so we can exploit them. Um, and, you know, how can we do that at as little cost to us as possible? How can we offload that cost, really, onto, onto individuals? Um, and I think it's important here that we note that everything under capitalism has this kind of dual um, existence because, of course, human beings, we don't reproduce or marry or live with people or care for others because capitalism needs a new generation of workers or, or anything like that. We do it because, you know, we want to, we like people, we need each other, um, you know, or all kinds of things. Or, of course, there can be pressure on people as well. <coughs> You know, the family for, for people, I think, can be a source, you know, often the main source of emotional support, of care, of security, of education a lot of the time. And all of those things can be a joy for everyone concerned. They can also be a massive burden and a massive pressure on people. Often they are both, you know, and I think often, of course, families can be much worse than that and, and actually not deliver those things and be a place of abuse and neglect and, and so on. And, and often that kind of um, abuse and neglect is, is allowed to go on precisely because of the whole ideology of the private family where you shut your door and then it's nobody's business what goes on behind it. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of the problematic things about the whole notion that this is a natural way to live because, of course, it means that there's an immense amount of pressure on a very small number of people to do all of these vast tasks, really, of raising a new human being into the world. And I think that's, that's a, a huge thing for anyone to do. I think the point uh, I'm trying to get at is that capital, capitalism, isn't driven by the desire primarily to trap women in homes or to, you know, even to oppress women specifically. It's driven by the need to make profit and it wants to seek the easiest way to do that. And I think it's useful here to, to take a bit of a historical approach in terms of how the family developed the way it did. Because another thing, of course, about the idea of the family is the idea that it's always been that way. You know, the Flintstones lived in a nuclear family and, and this is how it's always been. In reality, of course, the family 
has existed for a long time, but it hasn't always been the same, and it hasn't been certainly as kind of narrow and, and privatised as it is now under, under capitalism. You know, and certainly, in theory, capitalism doesn't need uh, the privatised nuclear family. There are other ways to raise children and feed people and keep them healthy. You know, you can do it in uh, hostels or in <laughs> orphanages or in, you know, and they, we can all think of examples actually where this has been the case and actually if you think about migrant workers somewhere like China today they don't get the luxury of living in a family actually people are separated people are forced into kind of um, you know living in kind of hostels dormitories uh, and all the rest of it and that's exactly what happened of course in the early days of industrial capitalism in Britain, when people, when the peasant family was broken up, when land was sold off and privatised, when people were forced into the new towns and cities, into the factories and so on, uh, in order to um, to work and uh, lived in those kind of dormitory conditions, sharing beds on different shifts with people uh, and so on. Um, you know, capitalism absolutely revolutionised the way that we produce things in society, the kinds of work that people do, the relations they have to each other while they're doing it. It tore apart all the old ways of living. Um, and actually, at first, you know, uh, people didn't really um, do the social reproduction inside of the home in those new cities and towns. There wasn't really that kind of home uh, as we think of it. People, workers had to live in appalling squalor, they ate at the new fast food outlets, the fried fish and Mrs Lovett's pies and all of these kind of things. And, um, and actually that led to a lot of problems for capitalism because children, uh, infant mortality was incredibly high, the uh, life expectancy was becoming very low, you know, people weren't healthy, um, people were turning to drink and, and, and so on. There were all kinds of problems when people weren't able to live, actually have space in their lives to uh, to step away from work, to step away from uh, you know the, their direct relationship to their boss, um, and I think that what happened is that capitalism kind of uh, reinvented the idea. You know, rather than just come up with some random new way of living, it reinvented the idea of the, the patriarchal family and kind of created it anew. And when you look at housing in Britain, think about around London. You know, outside of central London, you see just rows and rows and rows of terraced houses with two bedrooms or three bedrooms that, you know, and flats that were built for workers that all went up in the, in the space of a couple of decades, really, in the late 19th century, all over England this happened, um, to house people in precisely these kind of nuclear um, families. Um, you know, in these kind of hierarchical families as well and all the ideology that goes along with that, the father at the top, the mother below and the children um, at the bottom and, and no one else, by the way. You know, that's it in terms of who's allowed to be um, part, of the, part of the family. Um, and I think that what, you know, what this does, it, the family and women's oppression are far older than capitalism, but capitalism reshaped those things and, and made them uh, anew for... Uh, for the for the system today, um, so women are oppressed not because you know domestic labour creates value somehow, and actually yeah I think I missed that bit out. Um, you know when you look in terms of the uh, the wages for housework stuff, one of the the problems with that of course is that um, it's a misunderstanding of Marx in a way, isn't it? It's a misunderstanding of what value means. I think sometimes for some people. You know, saying that the housework doesn't have value in the capitalist sense sounds like an insult to all the women who are slaving away, doing the washing up, changing nappies and, and all the rest of it. But actually, value isn't, isn't a value judgment for Marx. In, in Marxism, it's about saying, are you creating that surplus value that I talked about earlier? You know, are you being exploited by a boss, creating, you know, something that makes profits in a system when it's sold on the market um, and the boss is taking a, a, a section of that from you. Actually, the work that women do in the home isn't exchanged on the market. It's not part of that kind of system of the exchange of value um, a, around the place. And so, you know, value, like I say, it's not a judgment of whether something, you know, a given human activity is meaningful or useful. It's a specific thing. It's a relationship between, uh, it's something that comes out of a relationship between a wage labourer um, and the boss who pays them less than the value of what they're producing. Um, 
And I think, you know, for all, all of these things in terms of trying to understand the role of the family in the system are about understanding how we change things. Um, and it shapes how we fight for women's liberation. I think if you have an understanding of the family under capitalism as absolutely central to the system in terms of reproducing the working class, then it means we're seeing women's oppression as a class issue because you can't really get rid of that, uh, that institution that, that is the root of women's oppression without getting rid of the system. Um, it's completely <coughs> inextricably linked um, to the central workings of capitalism. Capitalism needs the family because you know, the family is the historical form that that reproduction, uh, the social reproduction has taken in our society. And if we're going to get rid of the family, we have to get rid of the system. And when I say get rid of the family, I don't mean rip children from their mother's breast and so on. I mean uh, separate the kind of, um, I can't remember how Lenin put it now, but, you know, separate the kind of economic compulsion from the, the personal relationships you know, that people choose to have. That, that's all we mean, really. People should be able to choose how they live and not be kind of compelled to live in a particular way because of the needs um, of the system. So for us, women's <coughs> issues are class issues. You know, if they're not, if we just look in terms of women's issues, so-called, then, of course, you could turn to all kinds of women that we've seen emerge, you know, with books recently, uh, Lean In, um, the Sheryl Sandberg, the American kind of big businesswoman, you know, all kinds of similar figures who talk about, you know, women need to be more demanding to get equal pay with their very well-paid uh, other bosses at the top of the system. But actually, if you're talking about the world that we live in um, and the massive inequality that exists inside of it, and I mean, you know, class inequality, uh, then for women who aren't even getting paid as much as their low-paid male uh, workmates, equal pay isn't a very fantastically inspiring step forward. It's, it's a step forward, of course we're in favour of it, uh, and even though we have an Equal Pay Act for 40 years, we don't have it yet, but the reality is that, that women's liberation has to mean something a lot more than that. You know, even economic independence, even though it's a fantastically important thing for, for women to have, it's very limited, isn't it, if you're still dependent, basically, on the marketplace to provide a job for you. Um, it doesn't provide any kind of real certainty any more than it does for working class men. Um, I think for socialists, what all of this adds up to is that for us, so-called women's issues are actually class issues that, and all kinds of issues that affect women because of their role as carers in society, like austerity, like cutting, de cut, cutting local um, you know, public services, like cutting provision to libraries, like you know, uh, tuition fees for students, like cutting provision for childcare or making it really expensive uh, and so on. Um, all of these things put extra pressure on individual women in the home, but they also make life harder for working class men as well. And we have to understand that we have to, as socialists, be bringing these fights together. Um, struggle against the system can break out in all kinds of ways which aren't directly related to the class struggle, you know, specifically to the struggle in the workplace over wages and conditions. And I think sometimes this is one of the things that people misunderstand about Marxists, because we say that, you know, if we really want to change the system, if we want to fundamentally transform things, then that means transforming relations at the point of production. It means changing the whole way that we produce things in our society. But that doesn't mean that we don't have any interest in things outside of that because struggle breaks out in all kinds of ways the point is how can you win a struggle you know so I think when you look at something like the Russian Revolution it didn't break out inside the factory it broke out outside the factory of women who were queuing for bread and there wasn't enough bread because of the war and because of you know all the other problems and so women really marched for for bread to feed their families and that inspired, you know, and they went and got, actually dragged men out of the factories on strike and it, and it rolled over into, um, into a much broader um, struggle. Um, and the family, I think defending your family, sometimes, you know, fighting for the right to have a family can be something that spurs people on to fight. You know, it's not all about the family being a place that traps people. It, it certainly can be that as well, but it can also be something that, that pushes people into struggle. But we can only really win at the end of the day in the sphere of production at the heart of the system. So 
every fight for abortion rights, for reproductive control against sexist culture on, on campuses and so on, you know, fighting for childcare provision, uh, all of these things we have to do. But we also have to bring into that a discussion of the fight over wages and conditions in the workplace. We have to try and bring those struggles together. And when we're fighting in the workplace, we have to raise the issues of women's oppression, of sexism, of fighting for better provision of social things uh, you know, that, that will help people in the family. Um, I think that when we look at the tradition that we stand in of revolutionary socialists, you know, the tradition of Lenin and the Russian Revolution, uh, Lenin talked about being a tribune of the oppressed and that always means not just raising the question of oppression in the workplace, but it means raising the issue of wages and transforming the productive relations in the fight against oppression. It always means doing both and I think that's, that's our role as socialists today. I don't know the exact quote, but Mark said at one time uh, uh, about the reproduction in the family or reproduction, human reproduction, that, uh, oh, just leave that to to what humans wants to do sort of thing. Yeah? Um, and I think he's actually right. It sounds really horrible, but that's the way capitalists see it. And um, there's an old classic by Lindsay German, I think it's called well, Women's Oppression, Sex and Sexuality. Sex and hmm? the, uh, the old book, 1970s, I think it was written. Uh, a wonderful book, but there is one passage which I think she really goes completely wrong, where she says that because of the, because of the wife's work she puts uh, into reproducing the husband, she's actually reducing the value of this man, and therefore uh, he can work for a lower wage. I think this is a, a complete contradiction to what Mark says. And uh, Lisa Fogel says the opposite of what Lindsay German says. She's, I've read her book twice. Uh, she says um, capitalism actually doesn't have a material interest in, uh, in having the woman at home because then he has to pay, or the capitalist has to pay two wages basically, he has to pay the man who's actually working for him and the woman somehow she has to survive too. So they're both contradicting each other, I mean Lindsay German and Lisa Vogel. And interestingly enough, in Germany we produced, uh, I come from Germany, or live in Germany, and there um, we produced a long article based us basically on Lindsay German and on Lisa Fogel without even noticing that these, there's a basic uh, contradiction here. And I think this is weakening in us. I think we have to go back to Marx and say, however much drudgery you have at home, it's not work in the capitalist sense. Sally was speaking, I remembered when I was about five, uh, my brother was a war baby and went to a nursery, uh, and I was at home with my mum, uh, finding a photograph of him with my cousin in this really exciting looking room with lots of things to play with, and I said, what's that? And, he's, and she said, oh, Jeff went to a nursery. And this was the first time I heard of nurseries because I was at home with my mum. And I said, oh, that looks like fun. And yes, she said it was. I used to go to work. And this was a, a new idea for me that my mum went out to work. And suddenly my whole world turned upside down on the basis of this photograph. And I said, oh, which would you rather do? Which put her on the spot. Uh, <laughs> she had to say, I love being at home with you. Uh, but years later, she did own up, actually, that it was a huge change in her life. And she was, you know... Happy to have me, but she was pushed out of the workplace. And really, I want to look at the argument about wages for housework because I don't want well, I argue it crudely in my head, but it seems to me ultimately that the argument drops down because you have to look at where there is the power lies for women to improve their lot. Um, I'm thinking about the cuts we've got in Derbyshire to um, the children's centres, our short staff centres, more than 50% are being closed at the moment. Uh, and so we've done campaigning outside primary school gates. Overwhelming support. Women say to you, yeah, they had breastfeeding class, it was brilliant, I got a child with special needs, yeah. it kept me sane, meeting other mums. These short start centres were absolutely brilliant. And now we have Labour County Council shutting them down, and there's huge anger. But at our May Day demonstration, the best thing was that the workers in the short start centres were out in force, 
campaigning, and what we really need is for them now that the cut has gone through to ballot, to take strike action, and force those things to stay open. So where the possibility to change, to keep those centres lines, actually is with women in work. And really what capitalism has done is thrown us into the workplace, and I think we have to understand that that's the key place. Uh, it might be crude in the argument about wage for houses, housework, where that falls down. You wouldn't have that collective power that comes actually through being in the workplace. And my interesting, uh, the other story is, of course, the junior doctor strike. The imposition of the contract that they're having, or, you know, the, sorry, the newly negotiated contract, actually would fail any equality text, yeah. just because it is very difficult for uh, women doctors to operate that contract um, and to be getting, you know, be able to work part time, be a working mother, and be a junior doctor has been made more difficult. So, um, and I've been, you know, arguing with a woman who was very active during the strike about this is one of the ways to get people to think again about the contract, uh, to bring in the women's issues into into the workplace. Uh, but the last question I have really is that it seemed very obvious to me if you looked at women's lives in in the you know the factories in St Petersburg. Uh, that the demands for collective laundries, collective restaurants, uh, were very straightforward. Really, what, I mean, you know, we've talked about horrors, but in a sense, do we really want to get away the individual washing machine and have a collective one? I mean, it strikes me sometimes it would be a really good idea. Uh, you know, what's the equivalent now of what we would be demanding in a socialist society uh, in order to, to lift the drudgery? Contributions? Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Susan from Canada. I've just spent the last year struggling to deal with my aging parents who are in their 90s with absolutely no social support. And I had to leave my job um, in order to do that. And basically wasn't able to do anything else for the whole year. And and it had a terrible impact on me and, and the other people in my family. Um, I was fortunate that my father, having been a veteran of World War II, was actually able to get him into a veteran's center, which is extremely well funded. In fact, is considered the Rolls Royce of long-term care in Canada. And it's a, a model for what everybody should have because they, it's clean, they get all kinds of care, they have activities, it's, it's bright and sunny, they have grounds and gardens and art and music programs for people. Um, government pays for his wheelchair, and I have I know almost every everybody that I've told about my my problem with my parents has said yes, me too, or I know somebody, and you know they are, haven't been fortunate enough to be able to get into such a center as as I was, or I would still be struggling, maybe perhaps not with the direct care that I was, but but with the, uh, trying to raise the money to pay for very expensive costs, which are greater than the pensions that people get. So. Um, when you think about the the, it, the services that we need as women to be able to have decent lives and to be able to be in the workplace are primarily staffed by women, mm. right? And I think that that's the connection, is that the, the fight to defend the services, healthcare services, medical services, education services, is, is, is the fight for, you know, for women to be liberated from the individual responsibility that is laid upon our shoulders. And I think about things like the, the Chicago teacher strike, mm. which where, uh, which was quite successful, and it's still going on, this battle to, um, to, to uh, it, it was about custody education, but it really became about the right to have education, the right to have meaningful education, to, to take the burden off of, of, um, of families and to have the facilities in the school. When I talk about when I went to school, we had art and music and drama and sports. It was all included. And when you went home from school, you played. Mm. You played outside, yeah. right? I mean, what a strange concept. Yeah. Now, you know, my friend, my friends who are, you know, raising young children are running around trying to get their kids these 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 enriched uh, activities, which they can't afford, take up all their time. The kids have no time for play. The families are run ragged. They they, they don't want to deprive them of it because other kids have it, yeah. and it just it just you're just sinking under this huge weight. Of, of, of expectation that you personally have to carry the burden of. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming intolerable. People are breaking down I mean, in all kinds of ways, physically and emotionally. And it, it really is at a crisis. And I think that's part of what we're seeing in the, the whole crisis of the system, is that we can't take it anymore. 
we, and we have to do something. We have to fight back, and the only way to do that is collectively in, in, in the workplace. Die, that capitalism isn't driven by the need to oppress women or, or to have families or anything else. But I think that we can't, um, uh, you know, it's difficult to overestimate just how important the family actually has become. And I think that it's, um, it's been very resilient, it's changed so much. And I think, as has been pointed out, now with austerity and the cuts, I think it's taking on even more burden in society for the things that others have people have described. You know, that people can't go off to college and go live somewhere else anymore. They're staying mm. there as adults, or maybe they're going off and then coming back again because they can't afford to get their own house. So actually families, people are living with their families longer as young people, and then as people have pointed out, not only are people looking after grandchildren, but they're maybe looking after elderly people because there isn't the good provision and all the rest of it. So therefore, the role of the family, I think, is becoming even, even more important, and I think that when we, when we look at it, it's the system is using people's humanity, isn't it? That they want to care and be decent to people in order to cover for the social um, responsibility that's being cut back. But I think there's also a danger in some of the, the theorists that, that, you know, that Sally's referred to, the danger of some of them that just use social reproduction to say that in a way that capitalism is so flexible, it could just it wouldn't notice if the family wasn't there anymore, or, or, or implying that, you know, of course there's the prison camps and there's the dormitories. And I think it's it's quite right what, what Sally was pointing out, you know, they are in places like China, Qatar, and other places, but actually they're not a model for how modern capitalism, for instance, in the West, could, could nurture and have the next generation come out. And, and I think that there's a tendency to go further than just to say capitalism isn't driven by the need to maintain the family, to say, well then, forever doesn't really need it. You don't need to, to think that it's essential to actually understand that in the reality of modern, decaying, crisis-ridden capitalism, that they're not about to have collective social responsibility for things, are they? Because it works too well for them. And actually, in places where they want to have, and this is where we come back to surplus value and everything, where you want to extract the maximum surplus from people, actually you need highly educated, healthy, socialized workers, not people that are just going to drive them into the ground, you know, and everything else. And actually that means that there needs to be more than just the dorm and whatever. The other irony is, of course, those people in Qatar and China and everything that, that, that Sally rightly pointed to, they're often raising money for families yeah. thousands of months away, aren't they? They're not actually different. The family isn't taken out of that. It's, in fact, you know, people, um, you know, Latin American women who go into America to be nannies for the rich and everything, they're doing it, they're looking after other people's kids mm -hmm. so that richer women can have their career and family, while their families maybe will just, yeah. you know, so the whole thing we have to just understand that it's more complex um, than just taking, extracting social reproduction as an abstract thing um, and saying this could be done in any way, it happens to be done by the family now. There's an element of truth to that, but we can't go too far with that, otherwise we don't understand just how... Um, how rooted the family has become in terms of playing this useful role. And it could be a move away from a Marxist analysis if it's taken in the abstract and not seen as being part of the, um, the benefits that the family can give, that just pure seeing it as something that can be done in a dry way in, in terms of prison camps and orphanages, look how successful they are not. Yeah. You know? So they're, they're not a model, are they, as an alternative? It would be interesting what people say, what is a model for an alternative? We never have blueprints, do we, for socialism? I think the thing is there'll be choice, won't there? You know, you can cook at home, or you can go out to a restaurant, and it won't be gruel and horrible things. It'll be fantastic things that the rich, I go home with the bus past Angel, there's never a shortage yes. of lovely restaurants to go through. I'm sure that would be, the choice would be the key thing. We've probably only got time for Sarah and then you there. Sorry, sorry but we don't have time really. Yeah, I mean, I think actually talking about the family is really important. And in reality, people have grappled with the family, what does it mean, and how has it changed for centuries, really. And I think um, there are obviously a lot of explanations out there for why and how the family exists. And I think um, it's important to say that people who identify with, as being socialist feminists, is we do, as Marxists, we do have a lot in common with them, actually. And I think... Actually, someone describing themselves as a socialist feminist well, these different things, but it can quite often mean that they see inequality in society and they want to fight that, fight that, but they also see sexism in society um, and they, you know, they want to, to fight that too. But I think actually, fundamentally, seeing sort of two spheres of oppression, you know, capitalism and and patriarchy, 
uh, you know, inter interrelated with each other is actually quite an unhelpful um, way of doing it because I think it's also important what Sally said, actually like a robust critique of the nuclear family is in no way criticising individual relationships uh, between people because that's part of who we are as humans, we're, we're social beings. But with the next thing that follows that is that given the choice, like Judith just said, given the choice, people wouldn't necessarily live with two parents, uh, you know, 2.5 children and all the rest of it. Now, of course, when people talk about um, understanding um, oppression, of course, we have to listen to people's experiences of the nuclear family. And actually, it's quite interesting how these ideas are reproduced because I grew up with uh, a mother and a father, and I was told that it was my my job and my sister's job to do the cleaning um, mm -hmm. when my mother wasn't there, and um, it wasn't my two brothers' job. So maybe we're not that far off. <laughs> do you have to say? Um, um, but yeah, so it's important to listen to people's experience of oppression and really understand uh, the root causes of it. But then where does that leave us, actually? Because we've identified that there is a battle to be fought here, isn't there? But the next step is by identifying a force that not just exists, but a force that can win. And I think actually part of that is having a concrete understanding of what class is, what does it mean? Because I think social reproduction, uh, it muddies the waters actually about um, what labour is. I mean, um, maybe Sally will correct me, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in some of her earlier writings, Federici actually talks about her love of kind of baking and things like that, and she says that a lot of love goes into to housework. Um, so I think it's sort of it's a slightly um, confusing uh, understanding of. <laughs> of what labour is, but actually, like, exploitation is different from oppression, isn't it? You know, the, 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 the housework that people have to do is completely different from the experience of being exploited, because in part, exploitation is what, is what gives us power, because actually the working class is full of people who suffer from oppression, but actually, it is the working class, you know, men and women, um, regardless of sort of how much housework they do, um, it's actually this experience of exploitation that gives us the common ground um, and the ability to get rid of, um, you know, sexism um, forever. Hi, I just really wanted to follow on from what um, people were saying about choice, because I think that's a really, really key, important thing that we don't talk about enough, we don't emphasise enough as Marxists. Because when I first came around Marxist politics and the party, and people were talking about a social society and what it would look like, and they started talking about nurseries for children, I was absolutely horrified at this idea. I thought, I'm going to carry this baby for nine months, and then you're going to take it somewhere else and look after it so I can go to work. I don't, you know, this is not my ideal. Now, I understand that for many people that would be an ideal, and that, and, and, you know, some idea of shared. But, but I think it's really, really important that we do emphasize to people that, that, that it is about a choice and that some people may wish to work away from their children and may wish to do that and that some people may wish to have a balance of both. Um, because I work, I'm lucky enough to be a parent now, an eight-year-old child, and I work part-time. But and I do that because I want to spend time with my child. But well, what does that mean? It means that I leave work 10 minutes every day before I'm meant to leave work. So I have the stress of leaving work 10 minutes every day. Because if I don't leave 10, work 10 minutes early, I'm not at the school gate in time to pick my child up from school. So already there is no gap between leaving work and starting the next job of picking your child up. And then, like the comrade from um, Canada said, because you can't open the door and let your kids out just to play and to be themselves. You're then rushing to gymnastics, swimming, football, tennis, and all the other things. So there starts your next round of jobs. So the amount of pressure on parents and on women bringing children up, that's not a choice. That isn't what I meant when I thought I could spend this beautiful time with my beautiful eight-year-old child. And of course, I in reading homework, maths, and all the rest into that on top. That was never the idea I had when I thought of spending time with them. That you know that I and I actually enjoy my job. I'm lucky enough to do a job which is working with children that I actually enjoy. You know, but but still, it's, it's that 
pressure of running from one thing. I'm never fully present in any one place. And of course, that affects my work. It affects how under pressure I feel at work, but it also affects how snappy I am with my child at home when he suddenly doesn't want to put on his shoes. And I'm thinking, but you have to put on your shoes because we have 10 minutes to get there and we must be there now. And I think, you know, that huge pressure that the kind of society we live in puts on us in the way in which we bring up our children and the way we parent. I'm hoping that in a socialist society, I have to spend more time with my child, and it wouldn't matter if he wanted to have a think about which pair of shoes from because we need time to do it. And that's the kind of world I want. I'd still want to parent him, but I'd want to have more time to do it in that way. And other people may enjoy spending more time at work, and I hope that they'd have the choice of doing that. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, uh, yeah, the point someone made right at the beginning about how you never saw men in shops buying food, it made me think of the Ipcress file with Michael Caine, where one of the central scenes is him buying mushrooms. And this sets him apart from all yeah. other men because he understands what champignons are. And it's like a sign, it's a film made in the 60s, um, a sign of the kind of the cultural changes that you talked about, which I think is quite right. And I do think something that, that I forgot to say, of course, is about you know individual attitudes this is the point we're getting at isn't it it's not all about individual attitudes that shape what we're able to do because of course if you are in a relationship where you have a child and the woman you decide that the woman will stay at, at, at home at least at first then that puts pressure on the man to do more hours isn't it and and fathers of, of young children work some of the longest hours you know so even if they have a brilliant <coughs> attitude and want to help they physically cannot do that because because they're out the whole time and rarely get to see their children, let alone help out um, uh, around the home, uh, the home as much as, as you'd like. You know, so I think all of these things, we have to have a bit of patience with people about, you know, what, what they're able to do and how we can help people to, to be the people they want to be, really. You know, I think a lot of men, when you ask them in terms of their attitudes, they want, want to help out more, um, but often can't. And I think... Uh, the same applies in terms of conflict inside the house, in terms of the kind of pressures and people taking out the stress on each other. Of course, the, you know, the privatised home, this small unit of people with a, a closed door, it is, can be a pressure cooker for people as well, can't it? If you feel like you can't escape from it, you've got nowhere to vent your, um, whatever the phrase is, vent your spleen, it, it, except to the people closest to you. And this can be a, a, you know, a difficult situation that, that distorts relationships um, and so on. Um, I think the stuff about, um, yeah, family uh, versus social reproduction, yeah, I think it is really important what Judith was saying about how we approach it, you know, because when, when I read Lisa Fogel's book um, on social reproduction, I, I generally think, you know, I agree with basically where she's going with it, but what I found very noticeable is that it barely mentions the word family in the whole book, you know, the, whereas I think when in, in our tradition, you know, that uh, uh, developed in the, in the international socialist tradition, we tend to approach the question, you know, really following... Frederick Engels and you know and, and Marxist writers after after him um, approaching it very much in terms of the historically specific form of the family and how it develops and how that's not just something that's that's kind of accidental it's something that lots of factors come into and that, that is the reality so of course in theory um, there are other ways of, of raising children but in practice the family is there and in terms of its ideological role um, for us, you know, in in the world today, again, uh, uh, you know, it's right. It, it's ever present, isn't it? It's ever present. The idea of the family. You know, I don't have children, but that doesn't mean I'm somehow not part of the pressure of the family, or you know, and the impact that has on what I, as a woman, you know, uh, think about myself, even subconsciously. You know, it, it, it's still all there, isn't it? You don't actually have to live in a house with a mother and father and two point four children to to be part of that actually it's something that that sits you know like a ghost at, uh, at everyone's table the whole time really um i and i think it shapes you know it, it, it shapes everything um even when it's when it's not there you know as, as judith was saying in terms of migrant workers um uh, you know and and the way that you know the problem of there not being an alternative to it that is acceptable at the moment is that it's still the best thing you know people can hope to have in terms of um uh you know having a place that is secure you know or in theory secure and uh, caring and, and all the rest of it um uh yeah i think that 
Um, we also should approach this question, you know, as socialists, in terms of the kind of real human desires that people have, you know, that people have talked about. Uh, I mean, I've got several friends who've had babies recently. They all work, uh, at least part-time. Um, they are all knackered, skint, and really stressed all of the time. But they still are really happy, you know, they still really love the fact that they've got this new person in the world that they have a relationship with and it's still very fulfilling. You know, all of these things are actually uh, something that people do want to do and the tragedy is that they're not able to do them um, in the most effective way. I think that, um, you know, some of the... the uh, slogans of, of stuff like the, the Russian Revolution or even going back to the, to the Communist Manifesto in 1848, you know, which does talk about abolishing the family. And like I said before, you know, people get kind of scared of this concept um, and what we might replace it with. I mean, personally, in, in, you know, in terms of things like should we all have our own washing machines, you know, our... I suspect there's probably, you know, advancements in technology that would make them less wasteful and crazy because it just seems like complete madness for us all to have these very uh, energy inefficient machines in our houses re replicating the same tasks, you know, once a week when there could be one doing it the whole time, you know, at the end of the street or something. Um, but I suspect there's all kinds of things that can be mechanised in a much, much better way, um, actually, if the... Um, resources of society were put into trying to meet human needs rather than trying to meet the needs of the market and, and profit and so on. I think there could be massive leaps forward, couldn't there, in, in for, you know, being able to do lots of the things that, that amount to drudgery um, in this society. So when we talk about, which we don't by the way, but you know, if we get down to it and talk about abolishing the family, it, it doesn't mean abolishing the caring, it doesn't mean abolishing child rearing or abolishing having a group of people that you can rely on and have responsibilities towards. It means expanding all of those things. I think a social society is about having a greater capacity to uh, care for each other um, as human beings um, that, that goes way beyond you know, the kind of embattled feeling that we have at the moment of it being a competition of everyone against everyone else constantly competing for houses or school places or league tables and, and so on and only having room in your brain to actually care for a small number of people. Um, I think we'd be talking about you know, trying, you know, even inside of that society, we see huge amounts of uh, compassion and caring, you know, with the refugee crisis recently, the number of people who, who reach out to, to people who are in trouble. Um, and I think, you know, we're talking really about, um, about expanding all of that and making it so much easier for people to be able to take on, you know, other people's stresses and worries because they're not constantly, you know, struggling to just uh, to survive themselves, um, uh, you know, to pay the rent and, and all the rest of it. And I think when it comes, yeah, I mean, you might be right about, um, um, what's her name, Zylvia Federici. Um, I think you're right that she's confusing what, what we talk about in terms of, you know, what Marxists mean by labour or what Marxists mean by exploitation and work. Um, but there are, of course, lots of things in the home that people do that, that love goes into, you know, and it might be baking or it might be cooking or it might be, you know, whatever it is, all kinds of things that human beings do, uh, some of which relate um, to, the, to the family and to rearing the next generation of workers but we don't think of them in those terms. And again, I think we want to expand people's ability to do the things they love, to find new things that they didn't know they loved, and to be able to, to, to go out into the world and, and raise children who are confident and you know able to to um play in the streets because they're not going to get knocked over by cars and you know and uh, and so on um i think the question of the family really comes down of course to the heart of of how we feel we are as human beings and i think it's one of the things that is so uh, grim about capitalism is the way that it distorts things like personal relationships into something that seems kind of, you know, that becomes a problem in society and a problem that often individuals have to deal with themselves or feel they have to deal with. So, you know, people who are in relationships that are damaging or people who don't feel able um, to leave because of economic reasons and so on. Um, I think we want the kind of world where people have a genuine choice about who they live with, where they live, what kind of um, uh, relationships they have. Um, and who know that if for whatever reason they have to drop the baton, that there'll be someone else there to pick it up and not just, you know, 
through uh, a better welfare state, which actually is what that is for right now, and we have to defend that, but actually because we all live in a society where we don't feel that that child belongs to that adult and therefore they're the only person who's going to look after it, but actually we all feel that we're responsible f um, for each other and that we have the energy and the time um, to, to live up to that responsibility. So I think we could see a kind of society that was really transformed, and you see it just in big social struggles where these questions become you know the kind of Trotsky writes about this in the in the years after the Russian revolution all kinds of issues that had been private that had been just an issue for you to deal with in your private household become social issues to be discussed and debated and kind of argued out and solved on a much wider level it's not just your responsibility you know if you're in a, a home that is that is breaking up or that is having troubles or is violent or whatever Actually, it's everyone's responsibility to deal with that question, to challenge it, to, to help. Um, and so even just small glimpses of how much uh, a mass collective struggle can transform people's feeling about what they're capable of doing, I think tells us that if we actually change the whole world, you know, we'd be talking about massive leaps forward um, for how human beings relate to each other um, and the kind of society we'd be able to build.